Hello, welcome back. In the last lesson, we dealt with the first major film movement called German Expressionism. Today, we will be focusing on a very short but a very important film movement called Italian Neorealism. It is considered a very influential film movement. We will cover this movement in two lectures. So, this is the first of the two lectures. Before we delve into the Neorealism, we will be dealing with what is realism in art and how did neorealistic movement start historically and ideologically? What were the characteristics of the movement and who were the proponents of this movement? So, let us begin with what is realism? Realism as an art movement began in mid 1800s in France. So, this was a result or re of rejection of imagination and subjectivism that was going through in the late 1700s and the early 1800s which was called romanticism. So, what happened in this movement was that a person was depicted in a very romanticized way with a flowery uh, appearance to it, but this movement talked about the reality of life. It talked about a realism. Realism means something which is very lifelike, which you find in ordinary people. So, it depicted accurate events of ordinary people rather than the bourgeoisie, so called bourgeoisie of the or the elite class or the aristocrats of the society. This the proponents were Gustave Kobe, Edward Manet and John Francis Millet. Uh, this is uh, an example of the paintings done by Mosier Kobart. In this painting as you can see, it depicts a very very ordinary lifestyle. Three people meeting, there is a dog present and you can see in the background that it is very bland, it is a country landscape and the people are pretty ordinary everyday situation. It is a very what you can say photographic moment of an ordinary life. So, this is what realism movement in art was for ordinary people doing ordinary stuff in an ordinary setting which was completely different to romanticism. Now, this is what is forms the basis of the neo realistic movements of the mid 1940s. So, in films realism has always played an important role why because of course, what is cinema but a series of photographs and photographs depict what is there in the actual world. Early films also depicted real life situations. If you talk about Edison or we can talk about Lumiere brothers, all of them documented real life situations. They talked about people coming out of factories, they showed train arriving at the station which was the first Lumiere brothers films. But later on as the narrative became more and more complex the directors and the producers went more fantastical with their films. Milliers is a perfect example for this who film the a trip to the moon which came out in 1902 which we had discussed previously had a very fantastical narrative of a trip to the moon very very unscientific but it was a very prominent expressionistic movement. Later on in the late 1910s and the early 1920s German expressionism which we also discussed in the previous lesson had a very very fantastical and uh, what you can say unrealistic depiction. So, you had films like the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, Nosferatu which had a very very different sort of uh, expressions where human expressions and emotions played a more important part than reality of life or the slice of life at is said. But then slowly and slowly 
another movement came into being which was going towards neorealism which came out in the 1930s the early 1930s a film called taboo a story of the south seas directed by f w marno came out and this was one of the first films which had non professional actors most of them locals and had on location shooting which was a big step for a hollywood production because till that time all the productions that happened were inside a studio so when we look at the of course the arrival of the train by lumiere brothers and then of course the taboo poster as you can see it's a very exotic location and it was shot on location with their local actors so it was shot in tahiti which is in the pacific and the people that you see in the picture are actually locals who were hired there and they acted in this film you can see the still from the film and also the basic uh, shot of making that film by flarati and munro on the set what led to the fall of expressionism well the fall of expressionism happened because of various socio political reasons like german expressionism started to wane due to general political upheavals german expressionism was based in germany where in the late 1920s and the early 1930s a new political force called nazi party rose to power which has a very fascinistic leanings to it so many prominent directors technicians Germ of the german fil film industry fled to other countries and there were financial constraints on individual liberty because of this a uh, lot of films the german expressionism ceased to exist inside of germany and it migrated out of germany losing its heartland was a critical bl blow for the expressionistic movement because it was funded by the government german expressionism so it had lost all that funding and now it could not recreate it in the studio setup of hollywood during this time italy had changed early italian cinema was very diverse and but it was very small it in the 1910s and it remained so it was a very local cinema so italian films but had lost appeal to german and hollywood films by the 1930s because of course german and hollywood films had a better production quality so to revive this the government lend a hand now this government was a fascist government under mussolini but they took films to a different level they did not use films for propaganda purpose as was there in the german uh, a fascist nazi theory but they used it as an entertainment tool as a way to make the audience not look at their own real life so they had these rosy pictures which we later on known as the white telephone pictures we'll talk about it a little later so they established a film schools which is was called an italian film school which came up in the mid 1930s and they established a new studio called the Cinsetta Studios which was Italy's answer to Hollywood studio system but this came at a price even though the government started getting giving the funds to these films and they had these film school and these studios being built but there was general curtailment by the government so the free expression was banned so crime and immorality was also banned so you could not portray italy in a negative way by showing any crime or immorality italians were perfect citizens who followed the law and they were it was a crime free society which was very unrealistic to the period of italy at that point now the white telephone films that came out that's what uh, is the technical term given to those films of the fascist era of the 1930s in italy why were they called white telephone films well they are called white telephone films because of the nature and the opulence that they showed now for to understand actually what is white telephone films you need to look at the economic and the socio sector that italy was at that point general telephone in a household was generally was black in nature so uh, having a white telephone in your house was a sign of aristocracy and elitism and so in these films to highlight those eliteness and that aristocracy all the phones which were showcased were white in color which 
was a very small way but a very significant way to tell you that this was not your normal household this was an opulent household and of course the dresses and the headgear of the as you can see in these pictures was very elaborate if you look at the person on the left the girl with the elaborate headdress which is very unrealistic you will not find such headdresses in a real life situation or the gentlemen the two gentlemen on the right of this picture they are talking to each other but look at the dress of the gentleman on the left and you will see that it's made of silk and it has a very uh, aristocratic feel to it and of course lastly the third picture which has a maid answering a telephone which is white in color so this comes these stills are from one picture in 1933 which uh, which is samaro sempre which means i love you forever so look at the title and if you go back and look at the poster also you will find that it's about love it's about a romanticized way of showing the italian society there is nothing controversial about it there is no crime that is shown it's pretty bland it's just an entertainment drama that is playing out a romantic drama that is playing out so even though you had such creative personalities coming out of the film school and you had this funding for the films and you had a great studio in italy but the freedom of expression was curtailed and the film directors and the producers couldn't express themselves freely this laid the foundation of the neo realism that was to come in the 1940s now the neo realism starts in 1945 after the fall of fascism but it began 2 years earlier with a film called ossessione which translates to obsession this is regarded as the herald of the movement this was an adaptation of a american novel called the postman always rings twice you might have heard of this title because there are three hollywood films that are based on that on this novel on this particular novel last one coming out just a few years before now this novel has a sort of a pulp fiction feel to it and this film obsession is considered to be the best adaptation of the novel now in this the director visconti was actually defying the government decrees Imagine of cleanliness and propriety and he, how he was doing it but because this novel contains a very sensual and a very lustful uh, storyline it's about a woman who falls in love with another man outside the marriage and asks his her lover to kill her husband as you can see in this poster it talks about sexuality it talks about lustfulness it gives a sense of of what the picture is about but this did not go well with the government the mussolini government that was at that time ruling italy and so this was heavily censored and generally not shown throughout italy and was lost till it was rediscovered later in the 1940s the boom of the neo realism actually came a bit later 2 years later with the fall of fascism in italy at the end of world war 2 filmmakers like visconti rosolini vittorio di sica became important part of the neo realistic movement and they defined neo realistic movement so the first truly neo realistic film was rosolini's rome open city which came out in 1945 now in 1945 is the time with in uh, when world war 2 ended and this film actually projected italian neo realism onto the international stage because it was a huge international success and it put the spotlight on the neo realistic film movement. so this film centers on german occupation of italy during at the fag end of the world war 2 and the italian partisan efforts against those oppressive forces now if you look at the poster and compare it to the other poster that i've shown you just before you will see a vastly different film that poster was about showcased two people and their conflict here you have a more religious symbolism you have a priest and there you have a crucifixion emotif in the background and it has blood it has gore and it has a sense of realism to it which 
and talks about the psyche of the Italian society at the end of World War II and during the World War II. So, these are some stills from the movie which are vastly different to the stills that I showed you before of the white telephone films. You look at it, you can see soldiers standing with guns, a woman running which presumably is the husband who has been taken away by the soldiers and you can see the drama, you can see the pain, you can see the society and what it is going through at that point which was not there in the white telephone films and you can see that clearly as night and day just compare these two slides together. Now, this is what white telephone films are doing. So, this is this basically depicts the Italian society during World War II and white telephone films as means of entertainment was trying to gloss over this inaccuracy and inadequacy. So, what are the characteristics of the neorealistic movement? Well, the characteristics of a neorealistic movement are as follows. One, the film should showcase a slice of life. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, slice of life basically means it should showcase real life events happening to real life people. Just like the art movement of the 1800s, where you have show, you are showcasing basically the industrial and the commercial revolution and the changes that has brought, been brought about through those things in daily life of ordinary people. So, neorealistic movements was also showcasing the psychological, the emotional and the material problems that every day Italian citizen is facing in real life. Secondly, it should focus on social reality. Basically, what it is same as that, the social dynamics, the dynamics of a society which has undergone tremendous trauma through World War II, where you have every family losing a loved one where you have uh, government facilities overburdened, where you have normal everyday items becoming exorbitantly expensive. All those social realities and all those social problems that the society is going through is showcased. Thirdly, use of non-professional actors. Now, non-professional actors is a pretty unique to uh, neorealistic films. Now, why, why did the filmmakers or the proponents of this use non-professional actors? Well, they use non-professional actors so as to give a realism, to add another dimension of realism to the film. Because the actors are who are trained or who are professionally doing this job can act, but they cannot live the movement. They cannot know what that particular character is going through. So, to create that authenticity, to create that uh, what you can say is uh, the desire or the psychological, psychological aspect to that can only be achieved through non-professional actors. So, they used non-professional actors to a larger degree. Then of course, is location shooting which was very unique. It, it was not the first time that location shooting has been done as we have discussed earlier. Munro did it in 1931 with his film Taboo, but it got uh, what you can say cemented during this time. So, this was through neorealism, the impact that went in you know, Hollywood and other movements or the other areas like the British New Wave or the French New Wave which came on later on was the location shooting. So, the neorealism was responsible for taking the studio out of the film or the film out of the studio, whichever way you want to take it. Then of course, the documentary style. Because it was so realistic, it, was, it had a slice of life, it depicted social reality, it had non-professional actors and location shooting. All this today, we actually associate with documentary style. So, it had a very documentary feel for it. Like the camera was what you can say fly on the wall and was observing this. It was not part of it, but it was observing what was happening in real life. So, it had a very documenting effect to it. Now, moving forward, today we have discussed the rise of Italian fascism and how it created an environment or laid the foundation for the neorealistic movement. We also talked about the early films by like Taboo, which inspired the Italian directors. Uh, then we talked about the early to middle phase of neorealistic movement. So, what we uh, talked about today is actually just the beginning of neorealism. Though it was a very short 
fill movement, but it is very important and this is this lecture just covers 3, 4 years of beginning of it. The later years will be covered in the next lecture, where we will talk about neorealism through clips and movies that we have uh, arranged for ourselves and we will talk about how and these characteristics are present in these movies. In the next lesson, we will delve into the late stages of neorealism and the reason behind its decline. We will also discuss certain clips of important neorealistic film and understand the context and nature of neorealism. We will also cover the influence of neorealism on film and documentary making. So, let us continue this discussion in the next lecture. This that is all for today. Thank you.